Hey, Edith. Hey, Christy. Tell me a joke. Well, I wanted to tell you a vacuum joke. But what happened? It sucked too hard. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will accept that as kind of funny. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners from Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening has gotten very popular. And we've noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips. A fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Hello, Edith. Uh, hello, Christy. And hello, gardeners everywhere. How you doing? Well, you know, I'm excited about this week's topic, Edith. We're talking about scents of the garden, how to do a garden that smells nice. Yeah, scents meaning smells. Yeah. Not like common sense. Yeah. Exactly. With a T, not an S-E. It was really interesting. I have to admit it was more interesting than I thought it would be. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're going to talk about roses. But no, there was a lot. and a, a lot. And actually, I learned some things about roses and why they smell so good. Oh, good. So, but before that, how is the end of celery month going for you, Edith? It's coming to a close. Well, that went fast, didn't it? It, sure, it did. <laughs> 31 days of celery month. Um, yes, I'll be glad when it's over to... To be honest, the whole celery business. Um, and we should also tell folks, Edith, what yeah. are we doing together? We, we, You are directing me in a play, so we're both extremely busy. So if I yawn or anything, it's not because I'm bored. It's because I'm really tired. Yeah, because your director is just a she's, taskmaster. She's, she's a task. She's harsh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, isn't it interesting, Edith, that we have we've known each other for like 15 some years, yeah. right? Yeah. We live by each other. Um, and we've been doing this podcast for a year and a half together. Uh-huh. And we're both in the theater. Uh-huh. We go and see and support each other's shows th over the years, but we have never worked on a play together before. Yeah. Well, that kind of speaks to how big the scene is in Denver, too. That's true, too. You know. Yes. That really does. And the play we're doing is called You Will Get Sick at Benchmark Theater. So we hope people who are listening from the from Colorado will come mm -hmm. check it out because it opens in April 22nd. And and don't, don't let the uh, title fool you. It's not like a warning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's actually a very funny and um, touching play. So anyway, folks, that's why we're going to go to every other week. But it'll still be good. And you can maybe catch up on episodes that you haven't listened to. Yes, I'll bet you we have maybe one, maybe two people at most that have listened to every episode. Maybe. Oh, maybe people we should find busy. out. Here's the thing. People are getting busier just like we are. True. During the pandemic, nobody had anything yeah. to do. But, you know, I listen to podcasts as my, as a, as a way to escape. Uh, yeah. You know, I that's yeah. what I, when I'm out in the garden, you'll find me listening to a true crime. Yeah. But some people are listening to us. That's really cool. No true crime here. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> that you know of. That's true. <laughs> the engineer is giving us kind of an evil look over there. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, Edith. Yes. What the heck is happening in your garden this week? Well, here's what happened. The You know, as this past week has, didn't it snow? Yeah, it did it's a little bit. And the one day that, and it was really cold, and the one day that I had kind of set aside, the winds were like 50 miles an hour. Yeah. So I couldn't plant. Because we already know that what happens if you try to plant carrots on a windy day. Yes. You they get, Everywhere. You get carrots in the sidewalk cracks. Exactly. <laughs> and, and you know, there's no seeds that are really heavy and big, not in that kind of wind. So so I was unable to do almost anything. It's happening naturally now. The little little things are coming up. Yeah, that's you know. fun. So but, did you not even plant on St. Patrick's Day? You got some things planted, though, didn't you? No. no. Oh, my well, goodness. I, I planted two things, but not on St. Patrick's Day, which I think it was really cold and snowy. It was. Yeah. yeah. I planted um, radishes and the, the Gustav salad. Excellent. Wow, that, I did those two things. They're not up yet. My, my garlic, my new garlic continues to come up. The old garlic is coming up. 
as well as crocuses and tulips are starting, stuff like that. Bless their hearts. Yeah, I have that too in my garden. I have uh, crocus coming up. I also have, I could see the buds on the daffodils. You know, when they just start, you know, uh, yes, getting a little yes. bulbousy near the end. You and can so kind of see that they're going to be yellow. It's those really are budding. Yeah. And um, I walked out into my veggie garden and I can see that the chives are, have come back. Good. So I think if I give it a good, you know, a good combing to get out some of last year's uh-huh. yeah. old chives, I might be able to put chives on baked potatoes this weekend. Oh, I bet you you will. You know, chives are like impossible to kill. If anybody is looking for easy, easy plants, chives are yeah. so easy. And if you live in the Denver metro area, please let me know because I will gladly give you some. <laughs> and also, I have garlic chive seeds. I mean, there's also seeds you can that you can get. Yeah, my garlic's coming up. I have some leeks that overwintered, Edith, good. that I think are doing uh-huh. pretty good, and I might actually harvest them. I also noticed that my beets overwintered, so these are beets I think I planted in August. Oh, good. And they're, wow. they're, I don't know if they're any good, but I'll dig them up. And then um, my parsley is, you know, it kind of went a little dormant, but uh-huh. it's starting to turn green again. And then usually what I'll get in my vegetable garden, Edith, is um, bachelor buttons, which is a beautiful little annual flower that bees and butterflies love. It'll self-sow. It'll self-sow and it comes back. It is so pretty. And so what yeah. I do is I wait for it to get like two or three inches and then I move it to where I want it to be because obviously I don't want yeah bachelor buttons in the vegetable garden. And those are starting to come up. So, you know, we've had so much snow in March. I think it's going to be a great spring. And it's been a good kind of snow too. It's been yeah. the kind that is just soaked in. Yeah. Really nice. Nice and heavy. Not that grapple icy stuff that kills yeah. things. Yeah, it was good. Um, I did go out and check all my winter sewing jugs, Edith. Mm -hmm. I do that too. And this is a reminder for folks who are winter sowing. And if you don't know what we're talking about, this is an outdoor method of seed starting. And we still call it winter sowing, even though it's technically spring. You can still do it for a couple more months. And check to see if your jugs look dry. Mm -hmm. If they look like a dry cake batter that you just got out of the box. And the way you you can tell from far away, there should be condensation on the inside. Make sure you see that. You can see that from far away. Excellent point. And if there is, then the soil is probably correct, right? That's true. Yeah. And and if it isn't, then you should water it. And if you're using a milk jug and you're going to water from the top, uh, careful of splashing away your seeds with a heavy spray. Try to tip the, the milk jug a little bit or the bottle, whatever you're using to get it on the side. Or you know what I did is I just took the ones, eat it, that were dry. I just brought them in the house and I opened them up and I just used the kitchen, you know, sprayer really gently. Oh, that's good. Yeah, Um, that's good. However, I should tell you this. this Okay, I'm going to ask you this. Do you have anything green in your winter sewing jugs? No, no. I checked them yesterday and I do not. Do you? Yes. You do what? Well, of course, it's lettuce, but still. Very nice. Oh, good. That That's just such a good feeling. And I know I could just put lettuce in the ground and it'll come up. But I just thought as an experiment this year, I was going to try lettuce and see how it does. And it just, you know, it's so it's a great, satisfying thing to look into that little top of the milk uh-huh. jug and see the little green, bright yeah. green. Yeah, it's a wonderful Popping feeling. up. Um, and I was also going to tell folks this is that I'm doing some more winter sewing. Now's a great time to do um, more. Um, the hot hot weather plants? Yeah, like yeah. you could do more tender perennials or coming right up around here, or very ten- tender annuals. Uh-huh. And I noticed this when I went into my bag of soil that I had all dried out. And so friends, you may find it's a good idea if you go through to a bag of soil and it's all dried out to water the bag before you start using it. Because otherwise, it, there's a weird thing where the soil will actually like repel the water or you're watering it and you think you've got it. It's all wet, but it really is just the top. That's a wonderful idea, Christy. Yeah. Water your potting soil. Yeah, water the potting it's, soil. It's been around for a while. And then I wanted to say, Edith, um, I think I have a couple things that are dead. Where? In in your... In my yard. As I'm going through my garden cleanup. Oh. I, I'm about maybe halfway done cleaning things out and... And I, you know how you can just kind of tell like, oh, here comes a little green stuff here or, or it's too early for this to green out yet. So I'm not too worried about it. Yeah. But there are some things that should be greening up that aren't. And one, again, this year, Edith, is my yellow yarrow is not coming back. Oh, that's so odd. Which is weird because I went through decades of it where I had so much yarrow. I was 
giving it away by I the bucket I remember that. I wonder if it just got tired. If it's at the end of its lifespan, Christy. Maybe, but, oh, that could be because I've been getting yarrow from another neighbor down the street, from our friend Mel down the street, and she's been so generous giving it to me, and I get it. It's beautiful all year long. This is the second year it's happened, and I've hmm. enjoyed it all summer, and then the winter happens, and it just does not come back. Wow, well, hmm. Mystery. Mystery. Yeah, and then I have some fever few. Do you have fever few at all? You gave me some fever few a while back, and I think it's still alive. I got a, I got some, and I had three, a grouping of three, because it's nice in your flower garden to put things of three in, you know, odd numbers. Uh-huh. And one of them... Two of them are looking great, and one of them, hmm, kaput. Wow. Well, you know, Christy, speaking of garden mystery, you know, when we're doing research, sometimes you run into things that you don't expect to, and there's a lot of gardening forums online. Uh-huh. So I look, I was looking at this one, and um, this, this person named Red Dog, that's their handle, <laughs> is trying to find out what this plant is, and he posted, he, she posted, there's one that has no flowers, and it has white stuff that rubs off, what's it called? And then someone named Blue Umbrella answered by saying, that's called a man. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> <laughs> no flowers, and it has white stuff that rubs off. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Well, um, we have a brand new pop play for people, don't we? We do indeed, and it's based on a very popular thing that you can watch streaming. Do you watch Succession, Edith? I will as soon as it gets over to Netflix. I don't have whatever platform it's on. Oh, yeah, gotcha. I watched the first season. It's fantastic. Well, for all of our Succession fans, please enjoy a brand new pod play, Succession. Thank you for coming today, kids. I've spent my life building this garden. The flowers, the herbs, the trees, the vegetables, the curated placement of gnomes that look like bikers. I did it. It's all mine. So, let's get down to business. It is time for succession. I, Frozen Soil, hereby announce that I've divided my garden into three parts. I want to announce publicly what each of my children will inherit. My children? I'm going to give the largest share of my garden to the one who deserves it most. So, tell me what plant should follow in succession once my lettuce has bolted. Lentil soil? My oldest son? You speak first. Hey, Dad, I'm ready. I know you don't think I am. I know you don't think I have the right stuff to take over the garden, but I am. I say we go big or go home. It's beans. That's right, beans. We'll go huge. Twitter will be off the hook. I'll text Martha Stewart. I'm your white knight come to save the day. Life's not knights on horseback. It's the information on a seed packet. It's a fight for a Japanese hurry knife in the mud. Shuck off. Okay. Right. Okay. And now, what does my daughter, Chive, have to say? Tell me. I don't even want your garden. But I want you to succeed. Um, is this for real? Here, take this seed packet. Hold it in your hand. Uh-huh. Sure. Okay. I'll take it. Onions. Yay. Let's put in onions. Nah. I've changed my mind. Shuck off. Now you, my youngest child, Romaine. What can you tell me that will make me give you most of my garden? Speak. Um, more lettuce? Oh, shuck off. Okay. I blame myself. I spoiled all of you, and now you're shucked. I'm sorry, Lentil, you're a dead houseplant and shive. 
You're an upside-down tulip. Romaine, you are a failed sauerkraut experiment. Maybe you can start a podcast or collect gnomes that look like bikers or something. But for the world, no, I'm sorry. You're not made for gardening. You can't stand it. I've decided I am going to sell the garden. I feel it in my mulch. End of the day, that's all I shucking got. If I don't get out now, I leave compost on the table. Come on, Dad. What are you going to do with more compost, huh? Put it on your pile with all your other compost? Mm. Probably. Yeah. And what are we supposed to do? Make your own shucking compost pile. Now, shuck off. So, Christy, that was very clever. I enjoyed that, and it gave nothing away. There were no spoilers. Oh, that's very true. So if you're not caught up on Succession yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I loved uh, Jim Hunt and Josh Hartwell coming in to record that with us. Yeah. So we're back to using some actors sometimes. Isn't that nice? It is The pandemic is slowly... Maybe for a little bit for now. For now, yeah. We're not going to make any promises as if we were in charge, but. (laughs) Oh, could you imagine if we were, Edith? Yeah. Oh, I could. (laughs) I'd be sleeping right now. (laughs) Okay. Now, let's get to our exciting topic, Christy. Yeah. A garden that smells nice. What if you wanted to plant? Toward your toward the smell rather than anything else. Well, if you choose plants just for the way they look, I think you're missing out. Yeah, for sure. Because fragrant plants and flowers add so much to the overall ambience of your garden. And also, from doing a research on some of this, uh, a lot of these things that smell really wonderful are also medicinal. Oh, that makes total sense. I mean, that's what aromatherapy is, oh, right? Oh, yeah, so true. And you can also make teas and oils and all kinds of stuff. Now, I'm not an herbalist. I'm not a doctor. I'm just talking about some of the things that I found out that's doing great. some research. And I was also going to add on to what you're saying, Edith, is that smell is most closely linked with memory. Oh, yeah. And I think that's so interesting because I'm going through the things that I have in my yard and why I like them and mm-hmm. why they smell so good. And so much of it goes back to my memories. Well, sometimes when I smell like an apple tree, when the apples are there, Uh it takes me exactly back to the orchard I walked through every single day on the way home from school. It takes Uh you there as a whole. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It is amazing. And it's just, well, I mean, I found I had some things in the garden already that smell really good. And I was pleased with myself. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I was kind of surprised. In fact, uh, Folks, we're going to talk about the things that smell good in our gardens. And these are things that a lot of them grow in all zones. And it just right. just depends upon um, uh, how you want to take care of it. But a lot of these are are good in, in, in most zones throughout the United States and Canada. Also, they're kind of easy to take care of. Yeah. None of these things have given me a problem. Let's start with lavender, yes. which we both have. Tell us about your lavender. Well... Uh, one of the things I love about lavender is that, as as a lot of people know, it can keep you calm in times of stress, and it can lift your mood. It can help reduce feelings of anxiety, which is why a lot of you can find it in a lot of, you know, bath salts mm-hmm. or people put it on their mm-hmm. pillow or in sachets. Um, I have an English lavender, and the difference between a French lavender. And an English lavender is that English lavender is more cold hardy and lives a lot longer. Uh, Lavender, uh, English lavender can live up to 15 years. Oh, okay. French lavender, a little bit more sensitive to the cold and will only live for about five years. You know, that means I must have English lavender because that lavender, which I bought as a little $3 seedling, has now spread to an area probably four feet by two feet, and I even dug it up when it got really woody uh-huh. and replanted it when it was all grown, and two out of four of them took. Two died. That's not bad. That's not bad at all, because you're not right. supposed to be able to do that. Right. And as we've always said, if you're not killing things, sometimes you're doing something wrong. 
Well, there you know, you you're go. not really enjoying being a gardener. You got to kill some things. You do. There you I go. I would say the main thing also about lavender for folks is that it likes good drainage and it likes good air circulation. And mine is in the hot, hot sun. It likes the sun too. That's true. Does fine. And if I forget to water it, it does still does fine. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not picking. It it's not sensitive. Yeah. Not the English yeah. lavender. Now's the not the right time to cut it back, in my opinion. No, I no, always no. wait until I start seeing a little bit more growth, like mid-April. Like look at the plant, and it will tell you when it's ready. And to cut it back about a third, otherwise it will get super woody. Okay. In April, cut it back about a third mm -hmm. to a manageable thing. Okay. And then make sure when it's blooming, harvest some of it and use it because that also will create more circulation. Never harvest more than a third of the flowers at a time. You know, you can make your own potpourri. Yes. You know, my friend Ruth, she puts she she puts it in little sachets to, that you can, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. sleeping, like a little sleep. Pillow. Nice. Yeah. I put mine in uh, when I make my own herbs de Provence, so... Okay, let's move on. Yeah, to, let's move on. Let's move on to the lilac. Okay. One of the nicest scents I think that there are, and very pungent. Couple of problems with the lilac bush, which which I used to have seven of them. Uh-huh. And I've removed all but two. Here's what I found is that since I don't have a lawn and I don't mow the grass, the shoots come up every single year from the main trunk. Shoots come up through the soil. Oh, okay. So literally, they're trying to take over my yard. And oh, they no. will. <laughs> if you don't prune them, like my neighbor doesn't prune them, so but they're by a fence, they can reach 15, 20 feet high. Yeah, and you will lose your, you won't have as many blooms if you don't prune. Right. They're still pretty though. And your blooms will be way up high. You can't reach them. So that's right. <laughs> so the, if if you want to plant lilac, but don't put it in a container. It doesn't do great in containers. Make sure it gets lots of sun. And like you said, with the lavender, prune about a third out every single every single season. Wait until the flowers have have wilted, or what do you call mm -hmm. it when they're spent? Yeah, and then cut back to the stem. That's I love that smell so much. That smell reminds me of my mom. Oh, does it? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, yeah, it just reminds me of spring. Uh, how about rosemary? Oh, well, that's, that's, I love that because it's not a sweet smell. Oh, yes. Um, and you know, Edith, that there's a growing body of research that has found that the smell of rosemary can actually stimulate your memory. Really? Improve your mood and make you more alert and accurate. And it makes you think of pork. So that's always good. <laughs> It's kind of the opposite of lavender. Like if at lavender makes you relaxed. Yes. Rosemary, rosemary perks you up. A bit and, of a stimulant. And all rosemary needs is sunlight, good drainage, and good air circulation to survive. And if you live in a warm enough climate, then it will overwinter. Yes. Christy and I try to keep ours alive. She keeps hers outside. I took mine inside. We'll let you know if either one survived. Yeah, and, and we so. have the ARP variety, which ARP, is yeah. which is good for zone three. Oh, wow. So we'll see what that happens. Yeah. Mints are also, of course, such aromatic, wonderful things to have in the garden. I have a bunch of different kinds of mint. I have spearmint, apple mint, chocolate mint, and orange mint. Oh, my. Now, do you plant, plant them together? Because one of the things I read said, avoid growing different variety of varieties of mint close together whether in pots or in the ground as they lose their individual scent and flavor did do you find that to be true uh-oh uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> mine are all planted together let us know once it really gets growing let us know yeah did, is that true you know i do one of the things i love to do it is i love to just when i'm walking through the garden is to take a couple leaves yeah. and just rub them between my fingers and yeah. and enjoy the smell or pop them in my cup of coffee Oh, that's great. Or or tea, right? You could do it in tea. That's true, too. You can also dry them. Yeah. For um, mint tea and whatever. Now, just the thing about mint, uh, it does spread. It is yes. one of those, it will take over. Yeah. That, but, you know, that means, one, use it. Two, give it away. You you could do that. Or you could plant it in pots, containers. That's true. Or have a container with no bottom and sink the whole thing into the ground. Great idea. That's because, a great tip. Yeah, because you really, 
I mean, I I have mint that I pull out every year because it'll take over, you know. Yeah, and it also be, and it'll it'll come up like two feet away from where the main plant is. Yes, and you yes. want it to be all together, and nice and bushy. Um, and peppermint peppermint is a really good thing to grow because it's also the perfect digestive remedy. Yes, great. Yes, yeah, so it's a really good thing. And Let's, just to wrap up herbs, Edith, uh-huh. to talk about thyme, which the Greeks regarded so highly that to compliment someone, they would say that person smelled like thyme. I think that's a wonderful smell. I'm surprised there's no perfume, you know, eau de thyme. I think it'd be great. (laughs) I love that smell. Well, I also loved how thyme was used in Muslim countries for fumigating houses. Like, well, that's a good idea. Oh, it's like sage. Yeah. Like like people do sage here. Oh. And my thyme is a perennial. And I, it's just like my lavender. I cut it back a third every year Mine and too. use it a lot. Mine so too. So it doesn't get woody. Well, here we go. Let us take a break and listen to Garden Party. And folks, if you want to become a member of the Garden Party, all you have to do is click on the link in the show notes. And that means you're a supporter, a friend of Upside Down Tulips. And we will thank you. Here it is. Edith, Christy, what a lovely party. Thank you. No, thank you for being an attic tomato. Without your patronage, I don't know if we could keep on making upside down tulips. Cake? It's my home baked chocolate ganache. <gasps> that looks delicious. Cheesy drips? Um, no. Thank you, though. No. Oh. Of course, you couldn't keep going without us. People need affirmation. And money. Money's good. Yes, it is. Thank you, curmudgeons, for your support. Cake. Gimme cake. And cheesy drips? Get that away from me. Okay. Edith, did you make those cheesy drips? No, I got them at the store. I had a coupon. Dude, I'll have a cheesy drips. I knew I could count on the deadheaders. Here you go. Let's raise a glass to the deadheaders and to the lawn chair lettuces. We truly appreciate all levels of support. I just joined the garden party. I love the tips and tricks the podcast gives everybody. I can't believe I'm gardening, but I am. With your help, of course. Dudes, look behind you. It's Mother Nature. Hello. Mother Nature here. Everybody, a round of applause for Mother Nature. You're the reason we do Upside Down Tulips. And I appreciate it so, ladies. Far too often, I've been ignored, pushed aside in a take paradise and put up a parking lot sort of way. Cheesy drips? Don't be a lime quat. Okay, I'll take that as a no. Listeners, we'd love you to join our garden party. Curmudgeons, lawn chair lettuces, deadheaders, attic tomatoes, or mother and father nature. Support at any level keeps us going, and you get thank you gifts. We could send them cheesy drips. And we promise that will never happen. Oh. Thank you, garden party. Thank you indeed. We move on purposefully striding through our topic. I'm feeling like a professor. Okay. Chamomile. Oh, yeah. Chamomile. You know, Christy, I used to grow it and I forgot about it. How embarrassing is that? <laughs> I just forgot about it. And I love it. It's it's a smell that, it makes me think of a baby's head. Oh, that's like the best smell ever. That's like the best smell in the world. Yeah. It's better than a fancy car smell. Chamomile is that to me. I've never grown it. It's really easy to grow. Of course, you can just get seeds. Uh Uh-huh. It self-sows. And I was, as I was, there's two kinds. There's German and there's Roman. Roman chamomile, they use often as a ground cover or a creeping plant to soften the edges of your garden. German chamomile. Uh, chamomile is more often used for making tea. Okay. And speaking of that, I watched this whole video of how you can take a tea bag, chamomile tea, and then you can either on the ground or in a pot, open it up 
empty it, tamp it down, water it, and that's how you can plant your chamomile. Oh, is that clever? Is that clever? Yes. And they swear. I mean, I actually watch two or three different things to think, well, maybe she's just, you know, pulling my leg or wants to be on the internet. <clears throat> Who <But> doesn't? <laughs> exactly. But anyway, yeah. That's a great tip. Isn't that a great tip? Mm. So if you have some chamomile tea, get a tea bag and try it. Not the whole bag. Open it up. To, and and it's one of those things that it, it doesn't like to be covered with soil. It needs the sun to germinate. Gotcha. So that's why you just tamp and water. Chamomile. Tamp and water. Tamp and water. Uh, and speaking of chamomile, which is a kind of annual yes, flower, it is, it is. there are other annual flowers that have a great scent. Um, this one's kind of controversial, though, which is marigolds. You love the smell of marigolds, I love right? the smell of marigolds, yeah, but I don't like sweet smells, yeah. Uh, some people might find it overpowering, but it is. It kind of, I'd say, like, some people have said that it has a musky smell like wet hay or straw. Which I love wet hay or straw. I like the taste of wet hay and straw. You <laughs> so there me? you go. <laughs> And because of their strong scent, they're very offensive to many insects. So that's why people like to plant them around their vegetable gardens to help repel aphids and oh, Christy, cabbage I beetles. I forgot and- to say, I forgot to say that um, chamomile um, is also a deterrent, especially a cucumber pest deterrent. Oh, I like that. I like that too. Look how pretty a chamomile would look next to a cucumber plant. That would look plant. beautiful. That would be beautiful. Um. And I've heard this also that marigolds can enhance the growth of potatoes, roses, and tomatoes. Well, they they seem to do well with my tomatoes. I always plant them close to my tomatoes. Yeah, I love marigolds. Mm-hmm. I think they're they're a great flower. They're just great. Another flower I think that smells really great that I plant every year is it's... sweet asylum. Oh, I didn't. No, even... no, I'm sorry, Elysium. That's what it is. Oh, I was, oh okay, Elysium. Sweet Elysium. Yeah, yeah, and um. They are very attractive to bees and and um, butterflies, and they kind of have like a honey type fragrance. Uh-huh. The only problem with them is that if you plant them low on the ground, you have to really get down on your hands and knees and smell them. So I think they'd be great in like hanging baskets. Oh, or for people that like to be on their hands and knees on the ground, like I do. <laughs> That's true too. Uh, do but, yoga in your and, garden. And petunias also, I think the smell of petunias are nice. A lot of the things that we're talking about here, almost every one of them, I think, is um, a pollinator favorite. Oh, that's such a great point. They will attract bees and butterflies and all those great things, another reason to grow them. Uh, And so if an annual is a plant that has its whole life cycle in one year and then it's done and you have to get new ones or plant new ones. Or or let it self-sow. Let it self-sow the next year. my favorite. Then when it comes to perennials, the granddaddy... Of all of the best smelling perennials, of course, it's roses. But or yeah. honeysuckle. True, but I will we'll get to honeysuckle in a second. Okay, okay. Um, but that but a rose might be the first flower that one might think of. Yes. When it comes to having a scented garden. Yes. And did you know, Edith, that the fragrance of the bud is different than when the rose is fully opened? No. I didn't know that either. And that roses sm- smell most intense in the early morning. Huh. And where the smell comes from is its petals. Well, I kind of knew that. Where else would it come from? <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose that's true. That. Yeah, it's not going to come from the thorn, I guess. Huh? Yeah, really, really. People be, have scratchy noses. Here, have these thorns. <laughs> And uh, if people want, what some people think is one of the best smelling roses is a rose called Mr. Lincoln. Oh. And it's a deep, deep red. Because of the blood shot in his oh neck. My what? God, Edith. What? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he was shot in the head. That's the first thing that yeah. came to mind. Okay. All right. Um, well, somebody will have to write us in and tell us why they think that red rose is called Mr. Lincoln. I have no idea. Um, um, another good perennial that smells in my yard every year is my iris. Oh yeah, that's a really good smell. That that's a very if you like sweet smells, you will love the iris. And this is a special brand of iris. It's called Iris Pallida. And there's no mistaking it when it blooms because it smells like grape soda. Now make sure if you want to buy iris, make sure you ask, has this has the aroma been bred out? Because in a lot of 
iris, you, they, they don't smell like they used to. Yeah, it, they they would take actually iris padilla and they they bred it for the size of flower yeah. and the color of the flower. And then accidentally, the iris smell has been lost, Christy, but they're coming back to having more yeah, iris and have a good scent. Because a lot of times when you get rose bouquets, have you noticed you they don't, also don't have a smell? Yeah. They've also kind of yeah. been bred out. Interesting. So, yeah. For size and color. For size and color. And really, size is not the big deal in a garden because this, it's like the smaller, the smaller the fruit sometimes, the more concentrated the taste. That's what they say, Edith. That is what they say. So relax, gentlemen. Uh, and an iris is a great deer-resistant flower to grow, too, for our friends out there oh. who want to know it. Okay. I hope that's true. Okay, Edith. Yes. Tell everybody about your honeysuckle vine. Oh, I I have two honeysuckle vines. They give me, they, they they're just wonderful. They are. If you want hummingbirds, get get yourself some honeysuckle. They grow up in arbor. I have them right outside my bedroom window, so that in when they bloom, the smell can come wafting in. Nice, and it and it blooms. It comes back every year. It's a perennial. Every year, and it blooms for a really long time. But here's what I found out that I didn't know. There's two types, and one is Japanese honeysuckle, and the Japanese honeysuckle is invasive. Oh. And it's not as good for birds and pollinators as the regular honeysuckle. That's good to know. It's like junk food, they say, for for, for them, which, which I had no idea. Now, I'm sure you probably have to cut it back but honestly, yeah i'm just gonna ask you that yeah i don't know because i haven't done that I oh. haven't done it. <laughs> so so you don't have to do it well, does it start I don't with new green it. stuff at the bottom and go up or does it does it grow off of the things that are already tall it does both well there you go it does both so and i would say don't cut it back then yeah because it looks dead and yeah. the next thing you know there's a little green leaf good growing. good good yeah uh, I also love, uh, uh, speaking of perennials, I love hyacinth. That's a good one. Which is a bulb you plant in the fall. And though I want to tell you that some people consider the smell of a hyacinth a controversial odor. Huh. Um, I do not find it. I find the smell of it wonderful. But some people, and this might be the same people that think cilantro sm- uh, tastes like uh-huh, soap, Edith. Uh-huh, uh-huh. When they smell a hyacinth, they detect the order of poo. Christy, I don't think I want to live in a world where odors are controversial. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a complicated world, Edith. I mean, just have an opinion and then shut up. <laughs> okay. Um, I will also love the smell of um, my agastaki. Mm-hmm. Good. And uh, it's highly um, aromatic. It smells like root beer, in my opinion, like anise. That's kind of a good... Oh, I love anise. Uh-huh. And... Uh, also, you could say it could smell a little bit sometimes like lavender, and some people even say it smells like bubble gum. Ew. Okay. But I have um, mine is called, oh, you know, and also Agasaki is also called hummingbird mint, uh-huh. or sometimes it's called an anise hyssop, and mine is called a desert sunrise. And so it's sort of pinky, peachy, purpley, mm-hmm. a big hummingbird magnet. Mm-hmm. Christy, what about trees? I want yeah. to talk about my linden trees. Please do. If you are thinking of planting a tree, there's nothing quite like a linden tree. They have, every year, they get these yellow-white flowers, and they can be harvested for tea or infusion. They are, they're they very really? medicinal. I've never heard that before. I had somebody get a hold of me through Wheat Ridge Gardeners last year saying, uh-huh. is it too late? Can I harvest your linden flowers if you don't want them? Well, it was too late in the season. There's a particular time before uh-huh. they're too old. You have to harvest, cut back to the, it looks like there's a pod next to them. They call it a bracket. So harvest that, dry them, and then they make um, just the most delicious smelling and calming and cooling tea. Ooh. Or when infusion. your tree is in bloom this year, will you let me know? I want to come over and give it a big smell. Yes. And it also makes you sweat. Like if you have a fever really? or a cold. Oh. You know how yeah. they'd say sweat it out? Yeah. Linden, linden tea will make you sweat. 
Well, I think the best smelling tree I have is my choke cherry tree. Oh, that's a wonderful smell too. And yeah. the the smell of the blossoms are it's very strong, very sweet, and it has an almond like fragrance. And boy, there's nothing like it when that. And you know what? My whole yard smells like it when it's all in bloom. Wow. Speaking of which, Christy, I think we should go out and just smell things for a while now. Yeah, inappropriately. <laughs> Always. Yeah. <laughs> Controversially. <laughs> just get our nose up there. Make and say, our neighbors talk. What? You stink good. Yeah. Well, I hope everybody will consider growing a scented garden this year and give your nose a treat. Hey, someone's walking down the street with a big bag, and he's coming up to my house. Ruff, 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 ruff. Oh, you don't have a dog. Go ahead. <laughs> you can do the cats. Meow. Okay, great. And he's ringing my doorbell. Ring, ring. It's mailbag time. Hi, ring, everybody. ring. <laughs> Yay. Hi, everybody. Well, we have a letter here from Doug from Tennessee. Our good friend, Doug. Our good friend, Doug, who we call our Alex Trebek because he uses so many words we have to look up, etc. So he says, hi, Edith and Christy. Upon looking into the concept of pawpaw beer, that's from a previous episode, right, Christy? Right, because he has all these great pawpaws. He and, introduced us to pawpaws. And you can make beer out of it, and we challenged him to do it. Uh-huh. He says, upon looking into the concept, I won't be making any. Oh, <laughs> Doug. I'm fairly confident I could, but my personal preference for malt beverages is against adulterating them with fruit juices. That's something that I'd expect from hipsters, not regular folks. <laughs> That's my Doug. <laughs> <laughs> he likes his beer. No fruit. Plain. No fruit. Anyway, he says, I've been thinking about how to discourage our local rabbits from regarding our garden as a buffet, which has caused the spinach, lettuce, and carrot crops some unintentional thinning in years past. The obvious answer is a chicken wire fence with one-inch chicken wire the most commonly used. Unfortunately, rabbits are quite happy to dig right under such fencing. Yes, they are. They, you you got to watch those rabbits. Now, we have them because all the foxes died. Now, we all have rabbits. Yes. Okay, anyway, back to the chicken wire. The instructions always given to address this is to dig a six-inch trench along the fence line and insert the bottom half foot of the chicken wire in it when putting the fence up. These instructions were clearly written by people who have never actually tried to hang chicken wire fences. <laughs> Doing yeah. this with a garden shovel is virtually impossible, at least for a lazy older guy who has better things to do than dig a six-inch trench for hours and fill it back in. A non-starter. Agreed, Doug. Pro he's probably in the backyard drinking his beer, his non-fruity beer. That's what <laughs> That's he's doing. That's right, yeah. Much better use of his time than exactly. digging. Exactly. Instead, Doug says... I've come up with a plan I'm going to try, which I think will be both easier and likely more successful at stopping the rabbits than my current method of digging a bit, forcing the chicken wire into the resulting slit-like trench, failing, and then telling myself, good enough. And then popping a beer. <laughs> popping yet another <laughs> beer. God. I'm starting to worry about you, Doug. What I plan to do is take a three, maybe four foot high roll of chicken wire and run two, maybe two and a half feet of it along the fence post with the remaining foot, maybe foot and a half. Oh, my God. I know. Thanks, Fold, Doug. <laughs> folded at 90 degrees and laid on the grass outside the garden. Clever. I plan to fasten it down by using garden staples liberally, mm -hmm. then letting, I hope, the grass grow through it so the chicken through the chicken wire so I can mow it during the summer and fall. I'm of course also hoping that twelve to eighteen inches is enough distance from the fence to discourage any lapinal overachievers that would be vigorous rabbits mm. bunicular geniuses who can figure <laughs> out that digging is just with just a bit more might get them to the promised land of Mr. McGregor. <laughs> I'm assuming that the mythology has metastasized to the entire lepro. How do you say? I would say lep leperine. Lep leperine community around the world. I don't know who Mr. McGregor is, Doug. From oh, Tennessee. Who's Mr. McGregor? From Peter Rabbit. Oh, okay. See, he's a good writer, Doug, from Tennessee. You are a very good writer, Doug, from and, and a I, good chicken wire maker. And Thanks. I wonder if that could work. So if you bent it at 90 degrees, uh -huh. and so you don't have to put it in the trench, but you're just thinking like the bunnies might step on that and go, ew, I don't like it. I'm not going to dig. I, can, I can't dig. 
Oh. Because, so they're far enough away. So you've got like a foot and a foot or a foot and a half. Well, uh, Doug, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to let us know if this works because this letter he sent us this letter a while ago, right? Yeah, and we also want pictures. We want pictures and diagrams. We, diagrams. We, uh, yeah, and you know, <laughs> you let, let, like we're giving him tasks. That's not right. But yeah, please let us know <laughs> if it works, right? Yeah, sounds like because it should I work. know I have you know I have a bunny in my yard this year for the first. I've never had a bunny. Before yeah. everybody has bunnies now, and now, and I, I always think it's the same bunny, and her name is Cindy, and uh-huh. here I go again naming things, which you know mm-hmm. just ends in tragedy for me. So, but I, but I think Cindy is who nipped off my cauliflower last year. Oh, so shame gonna, on you, Cindy! I'm gonna clap to close everything, or do what Doug did. Yeah. Oh, well, you know that should be like on a bumper sticker. Always do what Doug does. Nice. Isn't that nice? Well, folks, if you have a good idea you want to share with everybody or questions, you want to celebrate what's happening in your garden, celebrate your failures. We love that, too. Please write to us at UpsideDownTulips.com or visit our website at UpsideDownTulips.com. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you can write to us at UpsideDownTulips at Gmail. I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> We had invited my favorite philosopher, Eric Fromm, to stop by, but then we realized he passed a a while ago. So instead, we have my delightful partner, Christy, with an inspiration. This week's inspiration comes from the writer Robert Louis Stevenson. Oh. It is a golden maxim to cultivate the garden for the nose, and the eyes will take care of themselves. Nice and so apropos. Oh, I try to follow the theme this week, Edith. That's so good. Thank you, Christy. And thank you, listeners out there, all of you. We are Edith Weiss and Christy Munter Larson. And if you got some laughs and some value out of this week's episode, could you please hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you, Denise Gentilini, for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. If you want more, just go to her website at denisegentilini.com or find that link at UpsideDownTulips.com. How about our actor friends, Jim Hunt, Josh Hartwell, and Jerry Hinshaw. Thank you. You guys are so talented and so kind. We are grateful for you. A very special thank you to Southwest Gardens, owned by our friend Carrie. He's our wonderful sponsor and friend of the show. And join us in two weeks for another episode that will delight and amaze you. And don't forget, if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Amen. Upside down.